Hi, I'm Peter Bassett, the Astronomy Roadshow Mobile Planetarium. So we can actually talk about engineering within space flight. It's actually a little bit easier, you might think. Uh, we could talk about the lunar rover, the moon buggy, if you like. Three were transported to the moon, uh, 1971 onwards, uh, between Apollo 15, Apollo 16 and Apollo 17. And uh, how did they actually get there? Because it's almost as big as the lunar module itself. So how did that actually arrive on the moon? But again, it's all down to engineering, design and technology. And I'll show you what I mean. Here's one I made earlier. Okay, I have a few bits of wood, right? It's not that difficult to do, actually. This is how the rover was actually stored inside the lunar module. It was essentially a fold-up car. And I'll show you how it was done. It's called kingpin hinges, going across the chassis. Two fold-up deck chairs, seats. And a 16mm movie camera. Control unit. And uh, you've got a communications antenna with the Earth, uh, broadband. It's actually a cocktail umbrella. That will do. <laughs> okay. And uh, anyway, you've got two batteries to power it. It is an electric car. Okay, it should look rather familiar now. Yeah, it's close enough. Okay. Uh, we've got something missing, haven't we? A driver. But well, six astronauts had the fortune to, to uh, drive this thing. And here's one. This is Jim Irwin. There we go. Uh, Apollo 15. He actually opened up our observatory at Canterbury in Kent in uh, 1991. Very nice chap. Didn't even charge. No. Okay. Anyway, so there you go. So now you've got an electric car with the moon, right? No problem. That's how it was transported there. But anyway, what about these two batteries? Now, this is what you need actually to power this thing. But today, in the 21st century uh, technology, if you want an electric car, there's a whole bank of batteries covering the entire chassis. So, uh, how come in 1971 we just had two uh, little ones to power it instead? The secret is, is in the requirements for this. Uh, it's completely different to requirements for electric car on Earth today. And I'll share what some of these differences are. Right, to produce a modern electric car, for starting it needs to be rechargeable. Uh, There's no use having one set of batteries, runs out of power, and that's it. You've got to change the batteries. Okay, no good whatsoever. It's not marketable, is it? So it needs to, to be recharged 10,000 times, and almost 10,000 cycles. And uh, each wheel, because of its weight, two tonnes, with all the payload, uh, needs to have at least 350 volts on each as well. There's an awful lot of power to generate there. And uh, it needs to be aerodynamic. Of course, you've got to have a windscreen, that's so it can cut through the air efficiently. And it's been weatherproof, of course, it could be practical, it could be raining or windy or so on. You don't know about the outside, do you? And uh, anyway, it needs to achieve 75 miles an hour as well, minimum, for the motorway use. And there's no use having a top speed of 30 or 40, uh, then go on the motorway, you'll get escorted off by the police, as well as everything fine. So uh, anyway, it needs to have a range of 150 miles. It gets no use pulling away from home and 30 miles later it is recharging already. You're not going to get very far fast, are you? And uh, battery lifespan, yeah, it's got to last a good 10 years on Earth. Uh, again, to make it marketable. No use having it last four, or six, four, five, six months or so. Put it into a garage and pay it £5,000 for a new ba bank of batteries and then do it again another, another few months later. No use whatsoever. So these are good 10 year lifespan. Right, other points that uh, children have come up with, 10 year old children, uh, when I've asked them about it, uh, they come up with a uh, selection of these. These are also required for modern electric car, of course, you need headlights, right, for, for dark uh, driving. And uh, these full beam, everything else, uh, brake lights, got to warn people behind you that you're braking. Uh, hazard lights, the dashboard, interiors, all got to be lit up. And uh, these windscreen wipers for the rain, you know, horn, uh, electric windows, all this kind of stuff. And, um, but on the moon, ah, okay, now then, let's see what you really need on the moon. Uh, these batteries, just one charge. That's all, in the factory, who needs that? And I'll come back to that point later. Anyway, 110 kilogram maximum, uh, with two astronauts on board, you're not going to have five, and they only need the two. Uh, even fully suited up, with moon rock samples collected and so on, on the way back to the lunar module. So you can wear 110 kilogram, it's about 6% of, of an electric car on Earth. And um, you know, because of that weight gain, it only needs 36 volts to power it on each wheel, even for a hill start in fact. And in fact it's designed so that if three of the motors failed, even one of them can keep operating the rover. All right? It's a very clever design. And uh, anyway, no aerodynamics to worry about, it hasn't got to cut through the air, there is no air, it's in a vacuum. And uh, no weatherproofing of course requires, it's not going to rain or it's not going to get windy. <laughs> okay? uh, these will achieve just 12 miles an hour. 
don't forget, there's no roads on the moon, is there? And uh, anyway, so uh, and also it's just to get you a destination a bit quicker than you would on foot before your air runs out. All right, your lim time limit on the on the surface of the moon is actually guaranteed. Uh, warranted by that, all right? Okay. Anyway, what else have we got? The range of 30 miles. That's all you need, all right? And uh, anyway, it's designed for just three excursions for the lunar module and back, uh, and that's it. All right, it hasn't got to do any long distance driving at all. And the battery lifespan, the age of three days. Okay, not 10 years. It works out at 0.082% of the requirement for one on Earth. See what I mean? Okay, so requirements are completely different. So can these two little batteries power this? Yeah, of course you can. No problem at all. You don't need a huge great bank of batteries. So in some ways it's easier building this than the modern electric car for today's market. Okay, anyway, so um, what else have we got then? Ah, yes, the communications antenna. How can this tiny little thing keep in touch with the Earth 240,000 miles away? It's actually quite easy. Because what have you got at the other end of the communications link? One of these. Okay, a radio telescope. It's amongst the world's largest. This one's Parks Observatory in uh, Australia, and you've got a massive great dish there, huge collecting area. And not only that, in the control room, you've got amplifiers that can amplify a signal by millions of times over. So a weak signal from the moon can be received on Earth quite easily. All right. Anyway, you've got several of these around the world, of course. Now the Earth rotates. Uh, different parts of the Earth face the moon each time. Anyway, so different radio telescope takes over as, as the Earth rotates every 24 hours. Yeah, well, this one's at parts, and if you want to know exactly how these, these operated and how they communicated with the, with the Moon, uh, all you've got to do is simply go on a tour. It's all free, okay? I've been to a few in America like this, Goldstone, all sorts of places, and they explained how it was all done. Uh, it wasn't that difficult at all. Anyway, so um, this, this, thing, this is not a mystery. Anyway, if you want to know more about uh, how the Lunar Rover operated, there is a book out called um, Lunar Rover. Okay. It's by the Haynes Manual series. It's great. I picked this up in the Works bookshop the other day for just three pounds. And uh, have a look for it and you might see a copy yourself. Anyway, it's got all the blueprints in there. It's got all the technical aspects of, of the uh, design. How it was all folded up and everything else. The power supply. All these sort of details are in there. It's a great book. Anyway, if you want to know more about this idea well, the moon landings never really happened because some people don't understand all these technical aspects. Uh, there's a book out specialising in that. It's called The Great Moon Landing Hoax, or was it? And uh, it contains all the stuff about the photography on the moon and cinematography, or the videos. Uh, it contains all the technical, or some of the technical details about the car, uh, about the lunar module, so it's not there now, and um, everything else. All, right, all these little aspects that these, these uh, conspiracy people come out with, it's all answered correctly. It's by somebody called um, Peter Bassett. Uh, ask me, sorry about that. Okay. Anyway, it's available if you're interested. Outspacebooks.com. Three versions of it, as well as uh, of other books. Uh, Colour, black and white, and ebook version too. And uh, anyway, but there's more information about this so-called moon landing hoax business on this website, moonlandinghoax.org. Uh, it gives all the correct answers, though. All the science all sorted out right, in advance. And uh, it might inspire you. Take up engineering, electronics, uh, radio astronomy, anything like that. Uh, all this stuff is interlinked. Space program is, is great fun. All right? Perhaps a little bit easier to get into than you might think. So have a go. Don't be scared of it. Okay, anyway, so um, anyway, good luck and um, hope you make a very wise career choice. Uh, thanks for your attention.